Red light, it's on. Oh man, I went to sleep. I'm gonna wake up. There it is. Okay, so we went through the Sadducees and Pharisees, we're gonna look at the other guys. So let me make this. Uh oh, I have a bit. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I don't have to match uh, clothing. I put it up on there too. <laughs> Found a space. Because when this goes away, if I've locked it, then I can't tell. I have to look at the second half because of the way the, the film works. I have to match clothing to the day. Okay, so if we understand who these guys are, right? And I looked at the source. I told you I picked sources. You know, this may not be, I didn't write this. Okay, these are sources from different uh, uh, encyclopedias and definitions about these guys. So, you know, the best way to do it, if we were writing a paper on it, right, we go get multiple sources. But I think this is plenty. So in this section where we first talk about a group, which is the Pharisees, I gave you about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and now we're at the Essenes. So... The Essenes were this Judaic religious group that flourished from the 2nd century to the 1st century. Uh, we're going to find out they were done, they were wiped out after the 1st century. They gained fame in modern times, which is funny because they're mentioned in multiple, we'll see where they're mentioned before, but because of the discovery of uh, at Karam, which is the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Karam community is widely believed to have been a major Essene compound. Look, look what it says. Widely believed, interesting, right? Where a group lived an ascetic life, trained priests to purify the temple of Jerusalem for preparation for the coming of the Messianic kingdom. Okay? We didn't hear anything about Messianic stuff much from the Pharisees or the Sadducees, but we certainly get it from the Essenes. Um, not to say they didn't, but they really weren't into that as much. The community preserved multiple copies of many of the Old Testament books. Untouched until they were discovered in 1946. Also produced its own unique religious literature found nowhere else. In recent years, some scholars have questioned whether the Kuram community was indeed Essenes, uh, whatever, have challenged the idea that the Dead Sea Scrolls were even produced by this community. Okay, like I said, this is, I didn't write this. Whether or not they lived at Kuram, the Essenes also lived elsewhere in ancient Israel. Their tradition was characterized by asceticism, strict adherence to Jewish law, special concern for the purity of the priesthood, and to believe in the imminent coming of the Messiah, or Messiahs, that would usher in the day of the Lord. The Gentile rule would be banished among the cataclysmic conflict between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Oh, wait, where have we heard this? This is all from the Apocrypha. Um, what do we they find, mean by unique religious literature? Not found know? anywhere else. And here's a, here's a great, okay, we can go into this. This is really important stuff. <laughs> Okay, I've told you this before, right? I'm afraid we're sticking to us. Because if tomorrow we find another Kuram, another Dead Sea Scroll thing, where we open up the boxes and we find preserved documents from the first century, right? Maybe we'll find another gospel. Maybe we'll find another letter, other letters of Paul. There were some made-up letters of Paul, but other documents you know, that we've never seen before that are real. What will the Catholic Church do? Evaluate their historicity and accept them. What will we do? Well, I've never seen that before. Why would we even think about it, right? And so therefore, we did that with the apocryphal documents, and yet every Bible, including the Luther, every Luther Bible to 1920, 1826, has the apocrypha in it. Well, we don't. Where's your apocrypha, right? But every, every Bible that Martin Luther read he didn't probably own any, but everyone he read, maybe his later years, because remember, they're so expensive that the average person can keep it. So, this is really cool. Unique literature, yeah. Because, uh, you know, the stuff that gets passed on is passed on how? It's copied by hand. And if somebody doesn't think it's worth copying, okay, there's a lot of stuff. Look, how many bookstores there are? Would you be willing to copy some of that stuff by hand? Matter of fact, some of it's really important. Yeah, but you, yeah, but 
But some of it's pornography. And it's in the schools. Just want to mention that to you so you could get, you know, a thing. <laughs> And why they're not arresting librarians and teachers in, the, in our schools in Kansas, I have no idea, because they are finding pornography in the schools, and yet they're not doing anything about it. And yes, I'm willing to ban books of pornography. Sorry, I'm, I will. I, I'm happy to do that. Um, anyway. But if it doesn't exist, how do they know that they wrote it? If it doesn't exist. No, no, it's, it, it's unique. It exists. It was in Quran. It was, but it, there's no other sources of it. It's like the Hammurabi text. By the way, Hammurabi text, when you hear that word, I think Gnosticism. Because almost all the Hammurabi documents are Gnostic documents. But they're unique, right? The, the, I think there are some other copies. Uh, I don't know. I, there are some very few copies. Like, for example, the Gospel of Thomas, right? Everyone should have read the Gospel of Thomas. It is a Gnostic Gospel of Christ. And it was found in the Hammurabi text. And I don't think there are any other copies of it anywhere else. But also the Gospel of Judas, right? How he wrote it when he was dead, I don't know. But there's the Gospel of Judas, and they, and they had this big thing in National Geographic. But it was a Hammurabi text. It's Gnostic. The Gnostic Gospels. It's really interesting how Gnosticism, and, and we, I've never taught, a, well, I've never taught a class about the Apostolic Fathers or the early church. We should, I, I don't know why we don't have classes about that in either our schools or, or even in our, you know, uh, uh, probably it's more important for us to go into the real, you know, into the scripture, scripture, right? But yet that is the history of the church. I was lucky when I went to college, I had some classes in, I went to a Luther college that um, turned away from the faith, uh, went to the other side, the dark side. But when I was there, they were on the good side still, Missouri Synod. And they were teaching. I, I got a lot of great Christian history. I was required to. I don't think PLU was ever Missouri Synod. Well, they were they were very conservative for until they were. <laughs> In my parents' day, which is about the same as yours, they were already. My parents were like they were already getting liberal, you know, advertising this and that. And well, I was writing letters to the editor that didn't get me banned, you know, the wokeism. But I was probably the lone voice. It, that was willing to speak out on certain issues in a community. I should see what I wrote. Uh, anyway, my point is simply this, you know, that as we look at ancient literature, there are, you know, there's a lot in church history and Christian history. And, and by the way, I think I got a really good education at Pacific Luther University. I'm not sure. I don't support them anymore. I'm kind of scary about them. Anyway, until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, here we go. The main source of information about the life and beliefs of the Essenes was detailed in the account of the work of first century historiographer Flagus Josephus, entitled The Jewish War. Look, okay, look at, look at this. Look at this. Remember? I told you. I told you when this was written before. It was written about 73 to 75 A.D. A.D. But it was about... Um, it? 20 years later. Well, it, 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 was, it was written about these guys in the first, oh, fifth century. Look at that. That's bad out of the thing, right? And I copied it direct. Anyway, let's see. It says, claiming first-hand knowledge. Did he have first-hand knowledge? No, he was not alive during, the, during that time period. No, he wrote it in 73, 75 uh, AD after the destruction of the temple. And he, he knew about the Essenes and lived during the period, but you're right. He didn't have direct information about the period he's writing about because the Jewish war was not about the time of um, during his life. He was writing about before his life, right? So, and then the Antiquities of the Jews, which was finished 20 years later, claiming first-hand knowledge, he refers to the Essenes as Esdoi and lists them as followers of one of the three sects in Judaism that he mentions. Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. Other contemporary accounts of the Essenes are part of the first century CE Jewish philosopher Philo. Um, and the excerpt from his, in this, preserved by the whatever Eusebius, the Essenes are also mentioned by the Roman equestrian, equestrian, it's funny, I have to say equestrian, Pliny the Elder. Pliny also, a geographer and explorer, located them in the desert near the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were first discovered. All these people in history that they mentioned were not writing about the period in which they lived. 
They did not have first-hand knowledge. Oh, but the New Testament's written Contemporary. contemporaneously. Oh, my goodness gracious. But yet, if do you see? Did you see anything they, about... You said they memorized, and the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were the... You know, they found there was no difference between what they had before and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ah, uh, there is. There is a difference. About 5% difference. 5%. 5%. And that's how we know that they mistranslated Red Sea. It's Reed Sea. We also know they mistranslated the coat of many colors. It's actually a long sleeve coat. So there are, and if you get a modern translation, they have fixed it. Because the Kurem Dead Sea Scrolls, we believe that the documents are more <coughs> accurate uh, than our contemporary documents. We have other issues, and we've talked about them, right? When we talked about Torah class, we went through all the Torah problems. There are less Torah problems than there are in any other document in antiquity, but there are Torah issues. And we've got to acknowledge those as Christians, especially when we, we bring out our Torah. Oh, we bring out our Bible, right? We need to know this because when you're fighting a war against evil, you've got to know what tools evil is going to use against you in fighting that war. And the word, first thing they're going to say is, well, what about the history of the Torah? It's, you know, you can fight them on the New Testament, but they won't go to the New Testament. Why won't they go to the New Testament? It's solid. It's solid, it's obvious, but the Old Testament has some issues. And you acknowledge them and you say, well, yeah. But what about Homer? What about Pliny? What about Josephus, right? And then they've got to go, <laughs> right? Because none of their contemporary history, and you notice this article, what does it start with? It's a good article. It starts with Josephus, it starts with Pliny, it starts with, you know, and it's funny, you call them the equestrian Pliny. I think that's funny. That's kind of a curse, but that's, you know what it means, right? What, why does it say equestrian plenty? Well, equestrian means that he's part of the ruling royalty class of the Romans. And so equestrian is a code word in Latin, meaning that he's like, you know, we would say he was noble, nobility in Britain, right? The noble lord. So that's what he's basically doing. Um, the Essenes are not much mentioned in the ancient rabbinical sources, and not at all in the New Testament. They're not. Our description of the ascetic practice of John the Baptist led some to uh, speculate he may have been associated with a group in some way. Josephus uses the name Essenes at Sinoi in his two main accounts, War, as well as in other contexts. Philo's usage of Essenoi, uh, Pliny's Latin text is Essene. At least during their later history, the Essenes seem to have had a wide following. According to Josephus, the Essenes settled not in one city, but in large numbers in every town. Uh, Josephus' reference to the gate of the Essenes and the Temple Mount suggests an Essene community living in the court of the city or regularly gathering this part of the temple precincts. How did the Dead Sea Scrolls indicate that the group at least at some point avoided Jerusalem and its temple is corrupt? Uh, speaks, Philo, Philo speaks of more than 4,000 Essenei living in Palestine, Syria. Uh, whatever, more precisely, many cities in Judea and many villages. Uh, you notice what they did? This is a trick. Is Palestine, Syria, such a place in the ancient world? Never existed. No, there's no Palestine anything. Uh, it was always called Judea or Israel or uh, in the Levant. So that's, they're using a modern term, which is a false term. That's why they say more precisely. But in any case, this is good stuff. Plenty of locations on the west side of the East Dead Sea, away from the coast, above the town of uh, Ing, uh, Ing Edda. Many ancient, many modern scholars and archaeologists associate this reference with the summit of Karem, the plateau, and the Judean desert along the Dead Sea. This view, though, is not yet conclusively proven, as many come to nominate um, the scholarly discussion of public perception of the Essenes. So, Basically, yes, everybody except the ancient, you know, scholars forgot about the Essenes until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in kind of the modern era. Uh, presuming, oh, and, and why does, okay, why did every schoolboy in Britain until the 20th century know about these guys? They all read Latin and they all read Greek. And so what did you give them to read? You gave them the New Testament, and then what did you give them? Josephus, you gave them plenty, right? You gave them the stuff they had, right? And so they read all this stuff. It's like, yeah, every kid's textbook, kid's textbook, K 
kids' textbook had these accounts in it. They knew more about history than we have in our little finger. They knew more in our little finger than we have in our whole body. Anyway, uh, presuming it's correct to identify the community of Quran with the Essenes, and the community of Quran are the authors of Dead Sea Scrolls. The Essenes Community School was called Yahad, meaning oneness of God. In order to differentiate themselves from these among the Jews, who repeatedly labeled the break, who they labeled the breakers of the covenant. This is expressed, especially in the unique prophetic scroll, Milhama, meaning the war, in which the master of the Essenes referred to the leader, teacher of righteousness, pre pre uh, pre prophesied that the Jewish so-called breakers of the covenant Jews will be on the other side, on the side of the sons of darkness in the great battle, the one day of the Lord. Uh, uh, well, let's see, we're going to get this? Nah, I don't know. Okay, what happened was, this is what Maccabees said. You notice they don't, they don't have anything about Maccabees. Why not, is my question. Maccabees 1 talks about what happened. And they don't mention the Essenes as a group. But what happened is this. Okay, Maccabees 1 tells us that the Jews were getting Hellenized. They were way getting Hellenized. And we don't know whether there was a new high priest, Jonathan was his name, and I think I'm going to mention him in a minute, but Jonathan said, you guys aren't following, you're becoming Hellenized, they were getting circumcised, they were participating in the games and the, and the gymnasiums, this is what Maccabees says. And so therefore Jonathan said, so the high priest of the time said, when the Maccabeans took over, remember the Maccabeans, the Maccabeans took over the priesthood, right? He was a Levite. Maccabus was a Levite. And his seven sons of Maccabus, the hammer, he said he was a Levite, but then he put his son as the head chief priest. And the chief priest was supposed to be an Aaronite, right? And what happened according to Maccabees is Jonathan the high priest took his ball and went home. He moved the community out of Jerusalem. And that's why this big fight started. So Maccabees says. And so the Essene communities presumably came from Jonathan and the priests that decided to go with him. The other priests and the Levites stuck around. Why would they do that? They lost their job. Their, their income. Their, their income, their meal train, they get meat, right? Because of the sacrifices. You know, it's our choice here. Lose your job, go out to the desert. Are you crazy? Right? And they had this asceticism, which we're going to see a little bit. It's going to be interesting. But in any case, the Essenes were apparently the high priests. Now, another group went to Alexandria. We also know that according to some other sources, which they don't mention, that they were probably sacrificing outside the temple. I also mention this. The Essenes believed, and by the way, Josephus may have been an Essene. Essenes did not go go to the bathroom within sight of Jerusalem. So they made a trek every day if they're Essene living in Jerusalem. They liked to go over the Mount of Olives because it was easier travel. But otherwise you had to go out into the desert away from where you could see the city. And they apparently had toilets, especially for the Essenes there in those areas. I think that would be a horror. They probably died from constipation. But in any case... Um, they, they had some really strange views. And by the way, Josephus talks about these views, but notice they didn't include some of that, which is interesting. Accounts by Josephus and Philo report the Essenes that are strictly celibate, communal life, other compared by scholars to later Christian mon monasticism. <laughs> interesting. However, Josephus speaks also of another rank of Essenes that did get married. According to Josephus, the Essenes practice collective ownership, uh, elected a leader whose orders, you notice he writes a lot about this, right? Because he's he was probably an Essene. Uh, forbidden from swearing oaths, sacrificing animals, um, that's what Philo said, controlled their temper, served as generals of peace, carried weapons only in protection of, against robbers, had no slaves, but served each other. Uh, and, uh, okay, had no slaves means what? They're poor. Okay. The ancient world is a slavery culture. The ancient world until 1836. When 18, was it 1836 to 1832? When Britain stopped slavery, basically, slavery it was a worldwide function in all the Western, Eastern, everywhere. Okay? 
There are more white slaves in Africa than there were black slaves in America, according to Thomas Sowell. This is a quote from Thomas Sowell. Almost ten times more. So, in any case, everybody had slaves. So, if you didn't have a slave, it meant you were poor, because you couldn't afford to have slaves. So, slavery was, was a cultural thing that everybody had. So, I think no slaves is not a... You, you know, as they say it, the way they write it, it seems like it's a, a positive practice. But in the ancient world, it was not a positive practice. Served each other, did not engage in trading. Both Josephus and Philo have lengthy accounts of their communal meetings, meals, and religious celebrations. You notice they don't tell about us. Yes, sir. It's, I missed man. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It says they're prohibited from sacrificing animals, but didn't they have an illegitimate uh, sacrificial system going on? We believe... Um, <coughs> They definitely did not support sacrifices in Jerusalem because why? Well, the priesthood wasn't the right line anymore. Right. The priesthood wasn't the right they line and they were. Along. Yeah. Now, we know that they were doing sacrifices in Alexandria. We also believe they were doing sacrifices other places. Um, this isn't a collusion or a hidden thing, but this is one of the underbelly things of. We're going to learn about this. Well, we already learned about this. Okay, remember who won in the big fight against the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots? He noticed kind of won, but who, who in the groups of those four won? Who around today? The Pharisees. The Pharisees. Yeah, the Pharisees won because they're the rabbis and they run all the synagogues and all this stuff. Well, the Pharisees, after the destruction of the temple, what did they say? Do you need sacrifice? We saw it last week, right? No, you don't need sacrifice. You just need a repentant heart. Wait, 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 wait. The whole Torah is about sacrifice. And you're telling me all you need is a repentant heart? So I bet you there was probably sacrifice going on in Babylon. There's probably sacrifice going on everywhere. Everywhere. After the destruction of the temple, who won? The rabbis won. What did the rabbis say? You didn't need sacrifice. Also, this is a very good thing for what? Money, money, right? Because if I have to go through a sacrificial system, it means I have to, I have to have the animals to sacrifice, right? And so that's just great in a diaspora or other point. And I'm not being negative about it. It's just, and I don't disagree with their view. However, they missed the point. The sacrifice happened. Who was Jesus Christ, right? That's what this is all about. The New Testament we're talking about is we looked at the Torah. The apocryphal documents, and even the Torah to a large degree, points to a Messiah. Their Messiah was Jesus Christ, and he was the final sacrifice. So in the Messianic era, he needs the Thanksgiving sacrifice, which really appeals to us and to the other guys. Yes, yes sir. Just curious. So the, there's a lot of modern-day Jews that want to rebuild the temple. Yeah. The temple's only for sacrifices. Are they wanting to start doing sa animal sacrifices again? There is a huge fight. Huge fight. Down on them. There is a huge <laughs> internal fight as well as an external fight. The Orthodox of Orthodox Jews, yeah, they want to bring back the Torah. The problem, however, is what? The priesthood, making priests because you've got to have a red heifer, and also because the rabbis are kind of opposed to it. But who makes up most of the Orthodox party? Rabbis. They're opposed to it because if you open that can of worms, you just opened a huge can of worms. Because there's lots of Jews all over the world now, and how are they going to sacrifice? How are they going to make it there? I mean, yeah, I guess they can travel, but you know how much it's going to cost if they have to go to Israel three times a year? I mean, this isn't a one-year uh, Mecca deal, yeah. right? Well, I have to get the Islamic people off the Temple Mount first, then they get Yeah, you yeah. got Well, it could, but you got to have a political <laughs> will, and, and you got to have... Well, what is the essence of sacrifice? Is it killing, destroying life, or is it burning, turning matter into energy, or what is it? Blood. Well, well that's, you know, that was all the Torah class. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go back and reteach all the Torah class, but I'll give you a really quick synopsis. The quick synopsis is this, okay? There are the five sacrifices. One, two, three, four, five. This is the Torah. The ascension sacrifice. 
the, uh, the sin or guilt sacrifice, the priest sacrifice, and the thanksgiving sacrifice. In the Messianic era, you just need the thanksgiving sacrifice. So this is the one that will be forever. And therefore, we have, a, we have a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving in the Eucharist. Okay? The ascension sacrifice is done once a day. The, remember we had that big fight that the, the, the Sadducee, uh, Pharisees thought that it should be given by the high priest from his own wealth. The Sadducees said no, it's just given by the nation, which is what the Torah says, by the way. Didn't you, it, wasn't it morning and evening they had to do it? No, I think it's just morning. The ascension sacrifice is morning. And by the way, this also in John Christophanes Mass, this parallels in the Mass, in our Mass. We don't call it a Mass, but in our service, the first thing we do is an ascension prayer. This is the ascension prayer. Next you have the confession. This is the confession. Confession. And confession. On some holy days they do do a, a later thing, but the ascension sacrifice is a holocaust. It's a burned sacrifice. Nothing is retained. Well, that's what I mean. Sacrifice. What, what is the essence of it? Anything up? Anything? Something? Anytime you eat meat, anytime you eat meat in the ancient world, everybody, pagan to Jewish people to everyone, all meat is sacrificed to a god. Except fish. Because you kill fish. Well, fish is not considered the meat. By stuff. Their definition. What's that? You kill the living stuff. The, it's killing life. The Torah sacrifice. said. Torah says. God said in the Torah that the life and the blood, and the flesh and the blood belong to him. And therefore, any time you take an animal life, you're supposed to give, give it back to God. He also said that human life is sacred, and therefore that's why we're not supposed to take human life, because it belongs to God. Life belongs to God, therefore you are not allowed to take it. However, you are allowed to put murderers to death. That was really clear in the Torah, too. And you're allowed to eat animals, but only if you give back the blood and the thing. That's why all Jewish meat is supposed to be sacrificed kosherly. Yeah. And to be kosherly sacrificed, it either is either sacrificed in the temple, or you have the oversight of a kosher butcher, and that kosher butcher is inspected by a rabbi or a priest in the ancient days. So everything based on this. Sin and guilt are sacrifices that are done for your sin or guilt. For either intentional, it's only for unintentional sin. Period. Not. Uh, guilt is for the unknown and, sac and that for the known, but it's supposed to be unintentional. Aha. The priest sacrifice is the meal sacrifice. Remember the Sadducees and the Pharisees are fighting about that one too. And then the Thanksgiving sacrifice is the one that we still do, and the one that was the main sacrifice. That's the tithe. That's the meat. That's the meal. In Jewish thought, all meat had to be properly killed, but they did not call it sacrifice if it was butchered in a kosher manner. So that's why they can legally eat meat that has been butchered properly. This is different than the rest of the world. The rest of the world, if you live in the pagan world, if you eat meat, it must be sacrificed. So all meat, that's why it was such a hardship for the, remember what was the thing they told them in Acts? Do not eat meat sacrificed to idols. The problem is all meat is sacrificed to idols. That's why Paul said, I ain't asking. I'm just eating. Paul lost the battle. If Paul had won the battle, we'd have a Seder. If you're really good, I love him, lamb. We'd have a lamb Seder, right, for our Eucharist. But because he lost, and John Christopher made us our thing, which is great. I'm not against it. But we do not. We have bread and wine, which is right out of the kosher Seder meal, right? We just lost the lamb. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so... But that's, that's, the, that's a quick, quick synopsis of the whole tour <laughs> and a thing. Um, well, wasn't the sacrifice that was giving animals blood instead of your blood? I mean, mm -hmm. the wages of sin is death. Well, right. you know, and there's 
to know forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Well, yes. It, this is what he called a... As I move down the philosophical or theological or, or tract, yes, we're moving there. But that is just for the sin and, thing, sin and guilt. But remember, the problem with this is that this only works if you did it unintentionally. But we know that all sin is it's intentional. This was an irony. Look, I think God is a Greek mind. I really love his mind. He would tell you, follow the science and really mean it. Right? Because they're not certainly following it today. But anyway, sin and guilt is... You know, that is the sacrifice that is for your sin that is unintentional. And so, we know we needed a sin, we needed a sacrifice that would work for intentional sin. That's God. God gave himself as a sacrifice. That's what we're moving up to, right? Because that's what we're learning or kind of studying. That's what Teen Hodos believes. So, yes. But the primary thing is, remember from the Torah... That the breath, the breath and the blood belong to God. So therefore, if you spill the blood, or if you spill the breath of an animal, you take its life, then you must sacrifice it according to, or you must do it in a kosher manner. You must do it in the correct manner because God insists. Because when God was okay, look, we're still like children, right? We're still asking. I'm not saying it's a childish question. I think it's a brilliant question. But we're still asking that question, right? So you stand before God and God, you know, uh, let's say we're in the old world, and God goes, look, the blood and the breath belong to me. And you say, well, what does that mean? It's a good Lutheran question, right? Good Lutheran yeah. Anyway, what does that mean? And God says, it means that you have to be doing it the right way and not the wrong way. And I'm going to give you a list. And that was a Noahic covenant, right? Don't rip it off of the animal. Don't do this. He gave some specific things. And then when the Mosaic Covenant came around, which we are not held to, God told them, this is how you do this. Right? This is how you, you responsibly act toward nature. Yes, you may eat animals, but, but the realization was what you said. It's a setup. I call it a setup in literature. When I write my books, I begin writing setups into the books to write to the climax. I write about this all the time. This was one of the setups that God did. God is a smart dude. He set it up even from the beginning about this. He, he could have made it so you gained all your electricity, all your energy through the electricity in the, in the, in the world, right? But he didn't. He didn't give you antennas where you're recharging yourself with a battery. He gave you a body where you consume and you eat it, right? And so from the very beginning, he knew that this was the plan that he had made. People are going to love to eat meat. I'm going to make this a setup. The setup is that you love meat. You want the stench of the sacrifice. You want that steak, right? And I'm going to create this thing where you will want to kill animals. But you have to show the respect. And then, what does he do? The thing about the blood. You know, the blood of the animal covers your sin. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. And then we get, but it won't work. You need more. What you need is God himself to sacrifice himself for the sin of the world. For your sin, right? This is all, oh, I'm touching the theological pool, I'm sorry. But this is what, you know, classic theology is. That's what it is, right? So that's how this all fits together. And God knew their hearts. Because over and over again throughout the Old Testament, he calls their sacrifices a stench. Because their hearts were hardened and they had turned from him. Right. And they did all of those horrible things with other idols. And his, his said, what do I want? I don't want your sacrifice. I want a contrite heart. So even then, they knew the message that it wasn't all about this physical blood. It was the internal repentance. And so we get the first big disinformation. No, there's no, there's been way disinformation since then. The rabbinic view is, oh, I no longer can do sacrifice. I know, according to the Mishnah, 
doesn't work. I know the Torah and the Mishnah tells me it doesn't work for intentional sin. I know that sin is really mostly intentional. But yet I still will say, all you need is repent. What did Jesus Christ say? Return and be convinced that I am the sacrifice for your sin. That's all the difference is, right? It's, it's because it's bound in a person. It's bound in a, a convincing. So the rabbis should be convinced themselves that they can achieve God without a sacrifice. But yet we know that's not true. The Torah teaches over and over again that a sacrifice is required. Anyway, okay. Yes, original sin in 15 minutes. Anyway, um, after three years of probation, <coughs> newly joined members would take an oath, include a, commit, a commitment to practice piety towards Yahweh and righteousness towards humanity to maintain a pure lifestyle. This wasn't written by a Jewish Orthodox because they wouldn't have written the vowels. To abstain from criminal and immoral acts, to transmit the rules incorrupted, to preserve the books of the Essenes. Their theology included belief in their mortality of the soul. Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, this is not the same as the Pharisees. The Pharisees believe in a physical resurrection. The Sadducees do not believe in any resurrection. The Essenes believe in a spiritual resurrection. This is very interesting in itself. But not necessarily the resurrection of the body. Immortality of soul. Okay, number one, when we start talking about soul, we have just moved into Greek worldview. Jesus is going to lesson you. Lesson us. Jesus is going to give you a lesson. The Nicodemus lesson is a lesson about the immortality of the soul. You don't get it because our, our writers are like totally not cogent to what's going on, which really cracks me up. The writer is, but not the translators. So when we get there, it'll be really fun. Part of the activities include purification by frequent bathing rituals. Okay, the bathing rituals. It's not bathing rituals. What is it? Yeah. Mikvah, immersion. immersion. The presence of a large system of rainwater catchment and storage in Quran supports the theory that the community was Essene. However, recent scholarly speculation suggests that they have actually been a community of potters with no particular yeah, sure. religious character. I love this. Don't you love this? You know? Yeah, you know, somebody 2,000 years later. After Josephus and all these guys that lived in that near that period, right, write about it, and yet two thousand years later you get somebody. Oh, they were just potter. They just need a lot of rain, a lot of water. <laughs> Manual discipline, other documents among the Dead Sea Scrolls commit a commitment to the strictest adherence to the letter of the Jewish law. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Their strictness far exceeded that of the Pharisees, and specifically opposed to the supposed lax and corrupt priests of the. Wait, 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 wait. <coughs> the Sadducees were more strict than the Pharisees. Right? I think this is funny. Who controlled the temple in collaboration with the Gentile administration of the Roman Empire? This is why I didn't take all the sources from the same source. Because I want you to see, this is really funny to me, right? So we get one guy saying, one, one source saying one thing, which we get some good information, right, from history, and then we get another one. And we see their conclusions are like, what? I think this is good. But wasn't it the Pharisees who made up all the rules about the rules about the rules and the ones that always taking to task about that. And the Sadducees, are, you know, were, they said, corrupt because it wasn't the right line. And so. This is what Tammy always tells me I should include on all these things. We have the Torah, right? The Torah. Sadducees said all that exists is the Torah. That's it. Then you have the Pharisees. The Pharisees said... Well, there's the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the oral Torah. It's not, it wasn't written down. It was passed down from Moses, and we got it. We got it. What did the, Pharisees, what did the Sadducees say? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> now, there is no Mishnah. That's what they said. The Torah is it. The Torah is it. And the Pharisees said, yeah, yeah, we know the Torah is it. We've got the Mishnah, too. we got it in our minds. We're going to write it down. They wrote it down in about 200, 200 AD, uh, you know, 90, I'd say 90 AD, but at least most people say by 200 AD it was written down. 
And then the Pharisees said, we also have the Talmud. The Talmud. The Talmud is our interpretation of the Mishnah and the Torah. Now, the Torah can't be interpreted, but the Mishnah can be interpreted. So, this is what Jesus was mad about. But weren't they more strict because they wanted the people to, oh, to no. um, follow all these rules? Like, you have to, you, know, you have to do this and that and the other thing. Like, not going, not doing any work on the South means this, 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 and this, and this, and this. Nope. The Sadducees said, the Torah says that you can't leave your home except for the courtyard of your house. You can enter the courtyard of the house, that's it. The Pharisees said, oh no, if you put a rope around Jerusalem, it's a courtyard, and therefore, we can, these were lax, they were really lax. Loopholes. Loopholes. Loophole? Big loopholes. They said you can't make a journey on the Shabbat, except if you send your servant ahead who's not a Jew, which is a lie, because the Torah says they're, if they're in Jewish lands, they're required to follow Jewish law. And if you're a, you have a Jewish servant or a servant and you're a Jewish, you have to make sure that they follow Jewish law. But the servants could go ahead and they could go from spot to spot leaving food because the Pharisees made a thing in the Talmud from the Mishnah that, yeah, if you ate, it was where you lived and therefore you could go to the spot where you could go visit mom on Mother's Day. They eat dinner. Okay? No, the Pharisees were really lax. Our view is incorrect. And that's what we saw when we did the Pharisees thing. The Sadducees were the really strict guys. And remember, there's a huge fight between the Pharisees themselves because you had the school of the Galil. School of the Galil. You had the Babylonian school. You had the Jerusalem school and the Alexandrian school. There's four schools, four schools that we know of, of Phariseeism. And in the New Testament, and when we get there, I don't know if there's any much in John, but in Mark and Matthew and Luke, you see it all the time. Because they're asking, Jesus is from the Galil, right? So these guys in Jerusalem keep asking him questions. Remember the question they asked him? Can a, can a husband uh, divorce his wife for any reason? The school of Galil believed that you could divorce your wife for any reason at all. The school of Jerusalem was more lax. They said, hey, you know, if she just cooks a meal bad, you can't divorce her for that. It has to be adultery. Remember that? That was a question. And when Jesus answered in a way that was different than they expected from the Jerusalem, uh, the school of Galil, then they were like, what? What? Because he answered from the Torah, not from the Mishnah or Talmud. So Jesus understood the Mishnah and the Talmud. I think he knew them big time. He knew Tanakh. He knew all that. But he would always go back to the Torah. Now, right, Jesus would have been a good Sadducee. I know you hate to hear that. But Jesus would have probably been a really good Sadducee because he would have been happy with Sadducees except they were not, in, they were not following the correct Aaronite thing, right? They had already cheated. And that's another problem today. So if they want to start sacrificing a temple again, you got to go find them priests. Because you better do GNA checks. In any case, um, Essenes resembled the Pharisees, and their emphasis incorporated the Jewish law into one's daily life. They differed in the Essenes were more strict and emphasized the priesthood as opposed to popular piety. But we see they're closer to the Sadducees, right? That's why I like these different sources more than the Pharisees. Tradition of the Quran committee seems to have been especially harsh, forbidding priests to even move their bowels on the Shabbat. Uh, oh. oh, I'm sorry about that. She needs permission. As well as requiring the separation of the sexes, the Pharisees would have considered unnatural. Um, another area of sanctity with the Essenes uh, that was their literature seems to support belief in two messiahs one made to cleanse the temple and the priesthood, the other to lead the war against the sons of darkness, reestablish the Davidic throne. We already saw that, right? Rambam thinks that too. Rambam from the 14th century. Uh, he was basically following Essene thought. Uh, based on very biblical accounts of Messiah's nature, his role, the view of his court, with later Jewish traditions requiring Messiah ben Aran, a priest of Messiah, and a Messiah ben David. Ah, oh, we already heard this, right? You already got this. already taught this. Here's some scholarly discussion. I don't know. I want to get finished with the, all these guys. Got to get to the zealots. 
We only got a little time left here. A uh, great deal of discussion arisen concerning the Essenes and their beliefs, especially the Dead Sea Scrolls. John the Baptist, widely regarded to be a prime example of an Essene who had left the communal life. And it's thought they aspired to emulate their own founding teacher, Righteousness, who was reportedly crucified. Now, this is really interesting, right? Because John the Baptist was the son of a priest, high priest priest, or a priest priest, an Aaronite, and a Sadducee. Got to be a Sadducee. But he went off to be an Essene, which is interesting. Because how do we know his priestly credentials were good? We don't. You know, they're best they had at the time. One theory of the formation of the Essenes suggests the movement was founded by an earlier Jewish high priest, dubbed by the Essenes, a teacher of the teacher's office of Bib Usurp, perhaps by Jonathan Maccabeus, priestly but not Zedekite lineage, who may be the person labeled in the Essene literature as a man of lies or false priest. This would also account for the bitter antagonism of some of the Dead Sea Scroll literature towards Sadducean priesthood, which controlled the temple for the Maccabean times until its destruction. Since the 19th century, attempts were made to connect early Christianity and Pythagorism with the Essenes. It is suggested John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. This is, this is good stuff. Um, remember, I, I don't agree with all this, I'm just giving it to you, this is what the world thinks about stuff. This is good information, I think. What is it about Pythagoreanism and Christianity that is such a big deal together? When we say those words, it means we're talking... Mysterion. Mysterion, mysterion. exactly. This, and remember, Christianity looks like a Mysterion, but it's not. Pythagoreanism is a Mysterion, big time. Um, that John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth were Essenes. I would agree with that. Uh, Martin A. Larson, the Essenes were Jewish Pythagoreans, <laughs> this is funny, who lived as monks, of, a, as vegetarian celibates. What, it mean, what does it mean if you're a vegetarian? It means what? No sacrifice. No sacrifice. No, it's not that you don't eat meat. Look, people, were, people did not eat meat because they were poor. So if you're a vegetarian, it means you can't either afford it or you're not sacrificing. Guess what they're not doing, supposedly? They may not be sacrificing, right? They could have kosher butchers, but whatever. Um, that's, that, I think that's funny. Yeah, okay, this is, this is what we call woke modernism because they're, they're applying modern ideas to an ancient group without any, uh, what do you call it, uh, thought, thought process. Uh, Self-reliant communities who shun marriage and family. Why do you shun marriage? That's what we believe. No, why do you shun marriage? In the ancient world, why do you shun marriage? There's only one reason. Couldn't afford it. You can't afford it. You can't afford it. You're living <coughs> hand to mouth. You're in a no slaves, vegetarians, no marriage. It means they are so poor. They cannot afford children. We in the modern era believe that you just have sex like prostitute rabbits, right? I mean, not us personally, but the world <laughs> believes this, right? And that sex is a thing. It's not. Marriage is sex. Sex is marriage. You get married for babies. You have babies, and you've got to support the babies. And if you get, you're a guy, you've got to support your wife and the family and whatever you do. If you can't, you don't get married because it's stupid. Because you're going to die, right? If I go from not having anything and I'm a vegetarian to two vegetarians with nothing, somebody's going to starve. And you add a third, you're all going to starve, okay? So this is, you know, we've got to read between the lines here. This, this modern stuff is silly to me. Um, shun marriage, family, preach coming war. Uh, oh, by the way, why did Christianity go to marriageless stuff? What you said is right. In Christianity... It became a theological idea. And Paul had said, you know, it's good if this, you know, they don't get married because it's a distraction from the, you know, preaching the word or whatever. Because Christ is coming in my generation, which was wrong, and Paul was wrong. And, okay, I love Paul. Paul's wrong about stuff, right? And he opened his mouth way too many times and started splitting it. And he says that even in his own letters. So, I'm loving Paul, but I'm telling you, he was wrong about some stuff. And by the way, what should we follow first? The Torah. What does the Torah say? Be fearful, multiply, take over the earth. Don't worry about carbon dioxide. It's silly. Um, 
It's the sun that makes heat on the earth. Anyway, uh, the sons of lightness reflected a separate influence from Zostrianism. They're bringing up Zostrianism. Remember, we talked about Zostrianism. Is it even around there? Oh, yeah. Zostrianism was Persian. Uh, Zostrianism is pretty old ish. That's why we have the, the mid, you know, 30, the 60s. 60 system was from Zostrianism. And 60 okay. was already kind of in place. The Zostrianism was still a new idea. By the way, because they call it Zostrianism, what does it automatically tell you? It is a mysterion. Pythagoreanism. Okay. According to Larson, the Essenes and Pythagoras resembled the Elosi or occult units of the Orphic Mysteries. Another mysterion. Ivor Lightblood, etc., argues that pimps find the roots of Essenism and Pythagoras and the roots of Christianity and Essenism are flawed. Yes. Another issue is the relationship between the Essoi and the Plato's um, Therapeutae and the Theides. Um, it may be argued that he regarded them as contemporary branch of the SLA, who he said pursued an active life. Um, why is this important? Okay, I, I know this is a little bit whatever, but the importance is for us to know what is the historical data we got, right? What, do we, what can we say? What can we prove? And it's really funny to see the impressions of the people that don't know anything about history writing about it. Contemporary authors Robert Eisman present differing views affirming the late Essenes were actually Christians. As Iceman considers the Dead Sea Scrolls to be Sadducean documents of Masonically inspired opposition to Roman Herodian rule in Palestine. There is no such thing as Palestine, but whatever. He defies uh, James the Just, the brother of Jesus, described in the book of Acts as a leader of the Christian church, the righteous one who led the opposition movement until his death, behest of the high priest Ananias, with wick the wicked priest in 62 uh, AD. Uh, where else do we find James the Just mentioned? He didn't say it. Josephus. Josephus mentions James the Just. Uh, he doesn't call him James the Just. He calls him James the brother of Jesus. The Essenes disappeared for the historical record for a century. They left virtually no trace. Well, we know why. We're going to find out. If you're going to tell us. Other than the above mentioned sources, until the discovery of the scrolls, speculate tradition may have contributed to Christian monasticism, and some Jewish mystical thought associates them with various hidden Kabbalistic or Hadistic trends. Cool. Currently, there are several modern Essene groups around the world. However, scholars of new religions, such as in his uh, state that the modern American Essene movement possesses no authentic historical ties, and etc. Uh, that's interesting itself, isn't it? Other scholars, Gideon, let's see this final thing here. Assert that Essene teachings have been hidden and assimilated in many mystical spiritual traditions around the world. Uh, publishes translation of the Essene Gospel of Peace, an ancient manuscript allegedly discovered in the archives of Vatican, an old Slavonic in the um, Royal Library of Hesperus. I haven't read that. The greatest legend book is certainly not an Essene document. Uh, probably not. I don't know where they found it. Uh, the Vatican has all kinds of really cool stuff to keep quiet. Remember I told you the Archco documents have been, you, you can't find them anymore, but there are copies and translations of them, so I have copies of that. The Zealots. We have time for Zealots. Yeah, we've got four minutes for Zealots. Zealots. <laughs> Let me finish up the Zealots. The Zealots are Jewish revolutionaries in the first century Israel whose religious zeal led them to fight the death against Roman domination, to attack or kill other Jews who collaborated with the Romans. Scholars disagree as to whether the name Zealots designated all the revolutionary groups in the first century or only of the factions active during the uh, Roman Jewish War of 66 to 70 uh, AD. Joseph Flavius, the Jewish general who surrendered to the Romans and whose official Roman history of the war furnishes the major source of it. <laughs> Ambiguous in his terminology, reference to the New Testament pseudographia and rabbinic literature adds to the confusion. I called them the blue turbans in my book because I was using some other sources, uh, but they call themselves. Zealots, and like I said, we don't know if there were many groups or a single group. 6 CE, Judah, uh, Judah, the Galilean, showed a zeal for God's law and land. We led a bolt against the Roman census in Judea. Woo, woo, woo. Um, it's interesting because that means there was another census. The original one was in 6 BC, uh, not common era, not AD. 
Um, he and his fathers fought to cleanse. This is the one talked about an axe to cleanse the land by taking violent vengeance against the Jews who cooperated. Jews would consider such cooperation to be idolatrous recognition of a Lord, Caesar, other than by God, other than God. Uh, vengeance, his fathers sought to appease God and thereby honor the cause against Romans based on the first commandment. Um, let's see. Revolt failed, but the Judah had originated the so-called fourth philosophy, no Lord but God. Uh, based on the first commandment, Judah's descendants emerged again. After all, the Judea became a Roman province in 44 AD. Their subsequent revolutionary actions against corrupt and inco incompetent uh, Roman authorities. Uh, I wrote about this in my book. Um, uh, corrupt and incompetent. Um, what are those? You know what those are, right? When you're writing histories, you don't call them corrupt and incompetent unless you put a quote from it, right? They can quote how, what is this? It is name calling. We find this all the time in literature. You know, you know, when we talk about Pharisees, we do name calling. When we talk about Sadducees, we do name calling. We just do, right? Sometimes it's worthwhile, sometimes it's not. I think this is silly. Uh, I think the Romans were probably much more competent and much more less corrupt than the Judeans themselves. They were stealing from the temple, right? Uh, Herod, did, or, or Pilate, took the money from the temple to build the aqueduct. <laughs> but the priest took the money from the temple, what? To make ends meet. I don't know. Pay themselves off. Um, in any case, whatever you want. Judah's descendants emerged again after Judah became, I got that, the subpoena revolutionary actions against corrupt and a communist set to continue the war, outbreak of the war in 66 A.D., Josephus usually refers to Judah's group as Scarii after Shaka, dagger used in assassinations. Although Josephus refers to Judah's factions as a Jewish sect, it's not clear that this group is to be identified with a revolutionary faction called Zealots. But wait, 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 wait. What did they say about Josephus in the previous article? How many sects? Three. Now they're calling the, S the Zealots mentioned by Josephus. Aha, I told you, Josephus mentions four Jewish sects, well actually five, Dean Hodos is also mentioned in Josephus. Um, let's see, it's not clear to groups to be identified with a revolutionary faction called Zealots, or indeed that there was such an organized group early in the first century. Many Jews venerated zealous action as a model for piety using biblical figure Phineas as a prototype. Such persons endured persecution for law or sought to destroy those who violated the law as a means to cleanse the land, a defiant, and thereby turn back God's wrath. Individuals, okay, okay, that is a lie, a flat-out lie. It's not Phineas. Who do they identify with? The Maccabees. The Maccabees. It wasn't Phineas, it was the Maccabees. Because in the Maccabees, you guys read the Maccabees, and also uh, is quoted even in uh, Jude. Jude talks about sawing people apart limb from limb, which is directly a quote from the Maccabees. So it was the Maccabean revolt was, that was the prototype, uh, and we're out of time. Such person endured persecution for the law or sought to destroy those who violated the laws and hence clean the land and climate, therefore turn back God's wrath in Jews such as Simon the Zealot, a, a disciple of Jesus, were zealous for God over a variety of legal issues. Sometimes it was the case of Maccabean revolt, Good. Zeal was not a dominant motivation for revolution. Uh, I, I'm, it was. Uh, what? It was, it was. It yeah, it was. was a dominant. That's what I meant. It, it's not Phineas. It's the Maccabean revolt. Not all zealots were revolutionaries. Not all revolutionaries were motivated by zeal. It's not until his account of the war of the period that Josephus refers to one of the wartime revolutionary groups, formerly as the zealots. Anyway, we'll finish up the zealots. I, I know we're, we're taking a lot of time, but I'd like everybody to have a foundation of this and you know what that's why the sources are good and stuff thank you father for your word and for you look through after us this week and then we pray amen and
Closed. Or they got played. Well, actually, yeah. if the Sadducees had been there, they would have been saying the same thing. But instead of being asking a question, they probably would smack her in the head. That's the difference. Because the Sadducees were all, yes. okay. they weren't around. I was like, they, I, during the Shabbat, right? I usually put that on They're at the temple, oh, right? right. You know but, that, and I didn't, so just saying, uh, the Pharisees were there standing. <laughs> you get to that. Yeah, so anyway, yeah. You know. I've heard that quite so weird now, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, always, right? Uh oh. So well, anyway. Well, being hypocrites because they made loopholes for themselves too. So. I think so that's what made Jesus mad, mad, right? Huh? That's what Jesus made Jesus the maddest. Yeah, the hypocrisy. Yeah. Right, right. That they, they, like I said, they made loopholes for themselves, but yeah. not for others, right? And Jesus called them out on it. A lot. <laughs>